The book we're talking about today is uh, about Phoenicians and Phoenician contribution to the humanity. Who were Phoenicians? The term Phoenician is, is a Greek term. It's the Greeks who named uh, the Phoenicians and uh, refers to um, a group of people who uh, lived um, uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean in the area of what is today uh, Lebanon, um, um, Western Syria, uh, and parts of what is today uh, Israel. Um, they were Canaanites. They spoke a Canaanite language, uh, closely related uh, to Hebrew. Um, and there are, you know, we know today about two branches of, uh, uh, of, of Canaanite, Hebrew being one of them, and Phoenician is, is the other. So, uh, in a sense, uh, were the Hebrews and the Phoenicians to speak to each other, uh, they would understand each other. Uh, it would be, you know, to put it in, in modern terms, it would be something analogous to, uh, you know, the, uh, the English uh, of Canada and the English of Lake Okeechobee, Florida. Um, so uh, there are differences, but uh, there are a lot of uh, similarities. Um, uh, th so Canaanite is a, uh, a northwestern Semitic language, uh, as opposed to uh, southeastern Semitic, uh, to which Arabic, for instance, belongs. Uh, so those were the Phoenicians. They lived in, uh, in city-states, uh, as most people in classical antiquity. Um, their major uh, states were Sidon, uh, Tyre, uh, Beirut, and Byblos. Um, they, uh, they were navigators, uh, they were merchants, uh, uh, they established colonies around uh, the Mediterranean solely for the purpose of selling their goods. Um, they made many contributions uh, in commerce, in navigation, uh, in, in literature, I should say in literacy, uh, they democratized literacy because uh, the invention of an alphabet is attributed to them, a simple alphabet. Um, they are credited with, um, uh, with the invention of the barter system. Uh, they didn't trade with currency, they traded with, with goods. Uh, so it is believed that they would, uh, they would sail, say, to North Africa, they would sail to southern Europe, southern France, they would land, they would um, put their goods on, on the coast and then retreat back to their ships and wait for the natives to come to, uh, to examine the goods and to leave something in return. Uh, they would, you know, sail back to the coast, they would examine what the natives have left, uh, if they agree with the exchange, then they would take uh, whatever the natives left them and, and sail off. So, so even though we talk in terms of uh, establishing colonies, those were commercial colonies. They were infinitely and infinitely pacifist uh, kind of people. They did not, they did not have an army. Um, and that's why perhaps we know very little about them. Your book is a translation of Charles Korn's speech delivered at the UNESCO in 1949. In your own words, Charles Korn is a towering national figure. But I'm afraid he's not well known in the United States. Uh, do you want to talk about his importance to the Lebanese national narrative? Okay, Charles Korn, why is he a towering Lebanese national figure and how come he's not uh, known by, by the American public? Um, He's, he's, Lebanon was not well known by the American public in, in the time of Charles Korn, uh, in the time of this conference paper in 1949. Um, Lebanon was barely coming out of the, the French colonial era. Uh, so the name Lebanon itself was not, was not known. Um, <clears throat> if I can take you back about um, uh, 10, 15 years, uh, uh, Charles Korm led a, um, actually uh, constructed the, uh, the Lebanese pavilion at uh, the New York World's Fair of 1939. Um, and he titled uh, the pavilion, uh, 6,000 Years of Peaceful Contributions to Mankind. And this, this became the title of this conference paper uh, uh, 10 years later. Um, in his... Um, 
uh, in his uh, publicity um, um, campaign, uh, the the mayor of New York, uh, LaGuardia, uh, would travel around the country as he was preparing for this major uh, global event. World fairs in the 19th and 20th centuries were very important for a country to show sort of, uh, you know, uh, parade uh, its power, its culture, etc. So uh, this event was very important for the city of New York, for the United States, of course, uh, because it coincided actually with uh, uh, the 150th anniversary of the inauguration of uh, George Washington as the first president of the United States. So it had that added uh, uh, element to it. So LaGuardia would travel uh, through the country um, and he would poke fun at earlier world fairs, uh, the Chicago World Fair, for instance, 1939. And he would say something to the effect that uh, at the New York World Fair, uh, we do not have uh, Sally Rand fans. Uh, Sally Rand uh, was a burlesque dancer of the 1920s and uh, 1930s, and she was a major attraction at the... Uh, at the Chicago uh, uh, World's Fair. Uh, she danced with uh, fans, and uh, presumably she was naked behind uh, those fans. Um, so LaGuardia would say, we do not have Sally Rand fans at uh, the New York World's Fair, but we do have cum, because we do have 10 cent hot dogs and the Lebanon Pavilion. So the Lebanon Pavilion became a major attraction, and the, the country was not known. Nobody knew what Lebanon was, let alone knowing uh, uh, Charles Corm. So Charles Corm constructed that pavilion, but in a sense, he also constructed the Lebanese uh, national narrative uh, based on this filiation from the Phoenicians uh, to modern times. Part of the reason uh, for the anonymity um, of Charles Corm, uh, as far as the American public was concerned, uh, was that he wrote in French. Uh, he, he didn't write in English, he didn't write in Arabic. Uh, most of his work was in French. Um, the, and, and some of the remarks that people made coming to this uh, uh, Lebanon pavilion uh, at the time um, uh, uh, said something to the effect that uh, there's too much French in this pavilion, but it's a swell exhibit uh, anyway. Um, Charles Corm, um, why is he important to the Lebanese national narrative? The 1939 World's Fair uh, represented uh, about 60 nations from around the world. Um, the countries, or what became countries later in the 1940s and 1950s uh, of the Middle East were not represented. They were represented as part of uh, the colonial pavilions of Great Britain and the colonial pavilion of France. So uh, Syria, Palestine were represented by the British and by the French. Lebanon was the only sort of colonial possession that, was, that represented itself uh, on its own with the approval of the French. Uh, so he was, he was a charismatic figure uh, in, in, in the sense that he, he was able to convince the French the, the rulers of Lebanon, if you will, that Lebanon was this distinct entity uh, that should represent itself. Uh, and he almost single-handedly constructed that pavilion uh, with his own money, uh, with the help of the Lebanese government and some help from the French colonial authorities. Um, it cost the Lebanese government and the French at the time about $60,000 to construct this pavilion. Uh, but the real cost of the pavilion in those days' money uh, was about a million dollars. So he contributed the rest of the funds uh, for the construction of, the, of, uh, of that pavilion. Um, to uh, sort of um, show you how important he was, even in French colonial cir circles, the inauguration of the Lebanon Pavilion was attended by French representatives, representatives of the French government, the, the, the French ambassador and uh, the French uh, commissioner general of, uh, of, the, um, of the French Pavilion, the French Pavilion and uh, the, uh, the colonies. Um, if I could very quickly read you uh, a quote from the speech that was given by the French Commissioner General of, um, uh, of the Pre uh, French Pavilion, um, 
he wrote something to the effect that um, uh, on, his, on this 150th anniversary of uh, the uh, Bastille Day, uh, France would have been honored and proud to welcome Lebanon into its own French pavilion at, at, the, um, uh, at the fair. And France would have been honored to draw the attention of America and the world to this nation, to this Lebanon's glorious history, to its present vitality, uh, to its future achievements. Alas, he says, this representative of France, the Lebanese government, with her wisdom, anxious to give uh, the new world a spectacle of the vitality, the cohesion, and the free a perseverant activity of the Lebanese people, the Lebanese government has decided to create this charming pavilion organized and set up with so great a love and taste by my eminent friend, Mr. Charles Korn. With what eagerness, responding to his desire, I have come on this dedication day to bring the affirmation of my friendship and the friendship of the French people uh, and our faith in the future of this country. Tell me then, is there any country better made to be understood and loved? My native country, France, in many places bears on its soil the creative signs of those exquisite builders who were the Phoenicians, the ancestors of the Lebanese people. This is a very, very, very important statement made by the colonial authorities. Uh, France, uh, in its infinite wisdom during the colonial era, uh, when it taught history to the colonized people, it taught French history. Lebanon was the only place in this colonial era where Lebanese history was taught, and, and the French approved of that, of that narrative. And um, many scholars argue uh, that Charles Korn was instrumental in the construction of that narrative that traced the origins of the modern Lebanese to uh, the ancient Phoenicians. And the bulk of his work um, uh, uh, pertained to national literature, national poetry. Uh, it had uh, um, uh, um, universal echoes, if you will, because he dealt with universal issues. He dealt with issues of humanism, universalism, etc. Uh, but this is the 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 uh, the frame, the image into which, uh, uh, if you will, he framed the Phoenicians as the ancestors of the modern Lebanese, but also as um, uh, universal purveyors of of culture. It is hard to overestimate the contribution of Phoenicians to the Western civilization. It will be interesting to hear about some of their travels and adventures, their remarkable seafaring achievements, especially their landing in America many centuries before Columbus. The issue of the, uh, the landing of the Phoenicians um, in America um, is still fraught with controversy. There are uh, scholars, um, uh, biblical scholars, uh, among them um, Cyrus Gordon, for instance, uh, who have made the argument that the Phoenicians did reach America uh, before the modern era, before Columbus. Um, this is not based on archaeology. It's based on uh, the navigation skills of, uh, of the Phoenicians, bas basically sort of uh, projecting into the future what the Phoenicians might have accomplished, where they might have sailed. Uh, they kept uh, the secrets uh, of, of their navigation skills uh, well guarded. They kept them as secrets. They did not share them. Um, they were the first, uh, scholars argue, the first mariners uh, to have um, sailed into the open sea. So they used the stars, they used uh, the, the, the movements, the, the, the heavens, the movements of the planets and so forth to guide them in, uh, in, their, um, in their navigation, in their sailing. Um, of course, many uh, peoples, civilizations were sailors before the Phoenicians, uh, but they sailed very close to land. They followed the contours of land. The Phoenicians were the first ones who took to the open sea. And that's what, what drives people like Cyrus Gordon uh, to make the argument that they 
they went beyond uh, the Mediterranean. They were on a quest for uh, their, the, their uh, uh, primary materials for their industries. Uh, they were famous, uh, and this they kept a secret also, they were famous um, uh, in the manufacture of the, uh, the purple dye. Um, um, it was also a well-guarded secret. Uh, it was a, a valued um, 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 uh, invention of the Phoenicians. Um, and purple became the color of royalty because it was valued, because it was expensive, because they sort of monopolized uh, this. So um, it is believed that they sailed beyond the Mediterranean uh, to look for the, the, the primary materials for, uh, uh, for the dye. Um, uh, going back to Charles Corm and his idea of the humanism of, of the Phoenicians, um, uh, although they were um, uh, colonizers in the sense that they established um, um, uh, a big navy, they, they built a big navy, they established uh, contou uh, uh, contours around uh, the Mediterranean, um, it was not an invasive kind of colonialism. It was for the purpose of selling uh, their goods. Um, part of their need uh, to transport with them a way with which uh, to keep track uh, uh, of, of, of their sales, of their commercial uh, enterprises, um, they invented a portable writing system, whereas, you know, peoples uh, in their times wrote on this, uh, you know, monumental architecture used, the Egyptians used hieroglyphs, the, um, the Babylonians, uh, the, the, uh, um, the peoples of the civilizations of Mesopotamia used uh, the, uh, the cuneiform system. Um, those systems of writing uh, were not portable. They, they were for... Um, you know, monumental um, uh, architecture that was carved in, in, uh, in buildings, in the rock, etc. Um, and uh, the writing systems of these people was limited to a minute uh, group of literate people. Scribes and priests were essentially the only people who were able uh, to write. Uh, because you had to know thousands upon thousands of shapes and forms, be it for the hieroglyphs or for the, for the cuneiform system. Uh, because they needed to keep track of uh, their commercial activities, um, uh, keep the books and so forth, the Phoenicians came up with an alphabet, uh, which consisted of 22 simple symbols. And with those symbols, they, they wrote uh, their language. And those symbols were eventually adopted by other people, the Greeks and, and the Romans. So what we know today as the Roman alphabet uh, is actually a Canaanite uh, Phoenician alphabet, those 22 uh, shapes. Uh, so this is a major contribution of the Phoenicians that Charles Coram talks about uh, and brags about, actually. Uh, and he argues that without this invention, none of the subsequent inventions of mankind would have been possible. Uh, try to imagine the, um, uh, the keyboard of your computer with, uh, with hieroglyphs, for instance. You take the word uh, phonetics, for instance, or uh, phoneme, or uh, phone, or phonology, we don't realize this because they, you know, they have become part of our um, uh, part of our modern languages. But they, they owe their origins to s something we're talking about, and that is the Phoenicians, the Phoenicians. Um, so that that was a, the 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 invention of this alphabet, the uh, the uh, the the reduction of the writing systems from something that was reserved to priests and and scribes and people who went through years uh, of of schooling in order to to perfect uh, a way of uh, uh, um, codifying people's uh, uh, thoughts uh, be became democratized. So everybody was able to read and write with the Phoenicians because you only had to learn uh, 22 shapes rather than hieroglyphs. Young Phoenicians movement members thought of ancient Lebanese as a progenitors of Western civilization. They also advocated for the millenarian Lebanese identity, separate and distinct from the modern-day 
a prevailing Arab identity in the Middle East. Who were young Phoenicians, and do they still have followers in our days? Okay. As I mentioned earlier, the, the Phoenicians were the, the biblical Canaanites, um, a, a, a breed of, of sailors, mariners, who established uh, um, um, contours around uh, 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 the Mediterranean. Uh, they were based in what is today Lebanon, the eastern coast of, uh, of the Mediterranean, the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and their city-states um, uh, spread from the north, from uh, what is today uh, uh, western Syria, coastal Syria, uh, down to, to Palestine, Israel. So they had uh, these city-states along uh, the coast of, uh, of the Mediterranean. So, um, uh, so logically, uh, this was their playground, this was their, their home base, if you will. So it sort of um, allowed uh, the Lebanese from uh, Charles Corm's uh, circle, the young Phoenicians, they, they called themselves the young Phoenicians, uh, to claim uh, that inheritance, to say that they are descendants of, uh, of the Phoenicians. And um, at a time um, uh, with the, the, uh, the, the fall of the Ottoman Empire uh, at the end of World War I, uh, the disruption of the Ottoman, um, Ottoman order, if you will, um, uh, new ideas of nationalism began emerging, among them uh, Arab nationalism, which called for the establishment of uh, an Arab kingdom on the former uh, uh, eastern uh, uh, possessions of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, there were other movements, also a Syrian movement that called for the establishment of a distinct uh, uh, nation state called Syria. Uh, and there was a movement in Lebanon. Uh, the Phoenician movement that called for the establishment of a distinct uh, Lebanese state that was that was not Arab that was that was Phoenician, and this is when they started sort of tracing uh, back their origins to uh, to the um, ancient Phoenicians. Um, does the idea still have echo in Lebanon today? Lebanon has fought um, two major uh, civil wars in in the past. 90 years of its uh, existence uh, over this issue of identity. Uh, is Lebanon Arab? Is it Phoenician? Is it Mediterranean? This is uh, a, uh, the, the question of the day, if you will, in Lebanon. The Lebanese are still um, uh, discussing. There are groups in Lebanon who uh, argue uh, that they are not Arabs, that the Lebanese are Lebanese, descendants of the Phoenicians, uh, as uh, alluded to in, in that quote from uh, the representative of the French government at the New York World's Fair in 1939. There are others who argue that uh, the Phoenicians have disappeared from existence and therefore the Lebanese are descendants of the Arab conquerors of the, of the seventh century. Uh, and it's still an issue that's being debated. Um, uh, in uh, the 1940s, um, as Lebanon was was uh, uh, fighting uh, for its independence uh, from France, um, uh, the Muslim components of Lebanese society, who uh, in their majority were advocates of Arab identity, and the Christian components of Lebanese society, who in their majority were uh, advocates of Phoenician identity, got together and came up with something called uh, the National Pact, which was a verbal agreement uh, between the ruling elites of Lebanon at the time um, uh, that said something to the effect uh, that Lebanon is an independent sovereign uh, uh, state, the eternal homeland of its children, with an Arab face. So this Arab face satisfied both sides of this national debate over identity. Uh, to the proponents of Arabism in Lebanon, the Arab face meant that Lebanon was Arab. To the largely Christian component uh, uh, in uh, Lebanese society, uh, the Arab face meant just the appearance, the outside, but the essence remained uh, non-Arab. Still, um, um, the debate kept raging. Uh, the uh, school curricula in Lebanon, uh, usually history, uh, the official history curriculum begins the history of Lebanon with the Phoenicians. So it begins with our ancestors, the Phoenicians. So you can see that, that this 
um, gave room for the for this uh, uh, for this conflict to to uh, to remain alive. Um, um, a war uh, uh, it, it exploded in 1975. Uh, for many re there were many um, uh, you know local uh, causes for the war. There were um, regional causes for the war, uh, but this debate over identity was uh, one of the main uh, issues that were uh, was being fought over in 1975. Uh, the war ended in 1989 with um, a kind of uh, retweaking of the Lebanese constitution and the introduction uh, this time of, uh, of a preamble to the Lebanese constitution, whereas the national pact that I spoke about earlier about Lebanon being this independent, distinct Mediterranean nation with an Arab face. In 1989, you had this preamble that in writing, uh, an addendum to the Lebanese constitution, if you will, that declared Lebanon an Arab country in its belonging and its in its identity and in its uh, commitments, uh, essentially putting an end with a, a constitutional document, putting an end to this debate. But of course, the debate did not end, and it's still raging today in Lebanon. There are, uh, you know, people still fighting over the essence of this Lebanese identity. Is it Arab? Is it Phoenician? What are your thoughts, if not wishes, for the future of Lebanon? I think we have to put it in its context, in its Middle Eastern context. I mean, Lebanon is, is uh, you know, shares many attributes with uh, neighboring countries in the Middle East, but it also has uh, many distinctive characteristics that make it uh, different and dissimilar from uh, other countries in the Middle East. So uh, I would say that uh, its future is and is not tied to what will emerge uh, in the in the Middle East, out of uh, the, the the current upheaval, um, uh, uh, some people, uh, among them myself, um, began uh, uh, talking in uh, in 2010, 2011, uh, about perhaps a reordering of the map of the Middle East. I mean, as we know, the the current map of the Middle East, the uh, the um, uh, the state order, the modern state order of the Middle East is a Western invention, uh, the outcome of the colonial era uh, at the time. Um, the, the area devolved onto uh, the, the, uh, the hands of the British and the French uh, after the, uh, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire at the end of World War I, uh, and they reordered the place. They created these new states that we know today as Syria, as Lebanon, as uh, Palestine, Israel, Jordan. These entities did not exist prior to 1918. Um, and there were, uh, in a sense, there were contrived points on a map. They, you know, if you look at the map, uh, uh, in a way, it's very similar to, to the map of uh, the United States, for instance, or the map of uh, South America. Uh, uh, it looks like somebody took this map, uh, took a pencil and a ruler, and drew lines with with a ruler. So, so. The current order did not take into consideration the, the diversity of the region, the ethnic diversity, the cultural diversity, religious uh, diversity, linguistic diversity. Um, so I, I began arguing in 2010 that perhaps uh, instead of continuing to, to, um, um, to speak uh, about this paradigm of the modern Middle East as if it represented a law of nature, we should perhaps start speaking in terms of the differences, what, what makes those countries so different from each other rather than what makes them uh, so similar. And perhaps uh, begin entertaining ideas of a reordering, redrawing of, uh, of, uh, of the map of the Middle East. And we see uh, something of that nature uh, taking place in Syria today. Uh, I mean, what, what is happening, uh, I mean, the word, the, 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 the phrase has not been, been used extensively yet, uh, but there are some people who are talking about, you know, what, what's going on in Syria is perhaps 
uh, a form of ethnic cleansing, basically an attempt at redrawing uh, um, little uh, smaller ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic states, uh, uh, answering to uh, the, the ethnic, uh, ethno-religious uh, divisions within uh, Syria itself. Um, incidentally, uh, what the French inherited from the Ottoman Empire um, in uh, 1918 uh, was not a state of Syria or a republic of Syria or a republic of Lebanon. They inherited Ottoman provinces. Um, some of them were uh, autonomous provinces. Uh, for instance, the Mutasarriflik of Jerusalem uh, had a special status. Uh, the Mutasarriflik, the province of Mount Lebanon, had a special status, autonomous status. Uh, but the French kept these divisions of the former Ottoman territories uh, uh, the way the, um, uh, the Ottomans had, um, had presented them. Uh, so... Um, in a sense, they inherited a province called the province of Damascus, the province of uh, Aleppo, the province of uh, the Druze Mountains, the province of Alexandretta. And for about 10, 20 years, the French kept uh, those divisions as is, as they had received them from, uh, from the Ottomans. Um, uh, they changed the terminology a bit. So the province of Damascus became the state of Damascus. Uh, the province of Aleppo became the state of Aleppo, and so on and so forth. So you had a state of the Alawite Mountain, which is being talked a lot about today. Uh, the Alawites of Syria, it is believed, are essentially trying to clear the area around what they consider their, uh, their you know, traditional uh, national home, if you will. Um, and uh, the state of uh, the Druze Mountains. So this is not a, uh, a prediction that I'm making. I'm suggesting that perhaps uh, it would be wise to look uh, back at history and see how uh, uh, these uh, administrative uh, areas uh, were governed and perhaps try to draw some lessons fr uh, from the past. And I think that the future of Lebanon will be dependent in a way on what will emerge uh, out of uh, what's going on in Syria today. Will Syria remain whole? Would it be partitioned? If Syria is partitioned, then perhaps Lebanon would, uh, would follow suit and would also um, end up perhaps being reduced to what was known as the, the province of Mount Lebanon under the Ottomans.